Okay, so I wanted to look at a couple of Diels Alder questions with you. Diels Alder chemistry, very important chemistry. Things you need to know about Diels Alder, it's a four plus two cyclo addition. So four plus two, we have a diene and a dienophile. So this is our diene here. So that means that this is our dienophile. And normally a dienophile has some kind of electron withdrawing group on it. And we have two nitrile groups, and those are both strongly electron withdrawing. So that means it's a good dienophile. And notice that our diene is in the S cis conformation, but it's locked in the S cis conformation in that six membered ring. So, something you want to remember is if your diene or your dienophile is part of a ring, you end up with a bicyclic structure that is bridged. So, a bridged bicyclic structure. So, you can kind of cross off. You can cross out C and D immediately. They're both bicyclic, but they're not bridged bicyclic compounds. So it's got to be either A or B. Now, you can probably also connect the dots because when you do a diels alder reaction, you end up um, um, losing two pi bonds. Okay, And then we form a pi bond. So that would mean that the answer has to be A because you're not going to have a pi bond here. However, I think a great way to solve a diels alder is to draw the mechanism. So we could do that quickly. We could say, OK, well, we're going to form a carbon-carbon bond here. Our dienophile is going to do this. And then we're going to make a pi bond here. So we're going to end up with something. So if I consider this ring in red, right, you're going to end up with the six carbons of the bridge like this. And then if our dienophile is in blue, so we're going to end up with a bond here and here. To these two carbon atoms in blue, and then we have a double bond formed here. Now, since we have a dienophile that's trans, since this is a trans dienophile, we're going to have one of the nitrile groups going up and one going down. So we're going to have one coming up like this in the exo position, and then we're going to have one going down in the endo position. Now, they kind of drew the wedge in dash, whatever that is, is a little bit funky the way that they drew it, but obviously the only possible answer is A. It cannot be B because we have a double bond in the wrong spot. And C and D can't be right because we have bicyclic compounds, but they're not bridged bicyclic. All right, so that's kind of the, the rationale for that one. One more quick question on Diels Alder, which is not really anything to do with drawing a mechanism. It says, under which set of conditions is this reaction best carried out? Now notice, this is a Diels Alder. Diels Alder, it's a four plus two cyclo addition. You can practice drawing your curved arrows. You can see that what they drew is the endo product that we get here. Everything is set up. But does anybody remember, what are the conditions for a Diels Alder? Would it be strong acid, strong base, like an A or B, heating and hexane, or using UV light? Could anybody answer this one for me? Now, how do you get a Diels Alder to go? So the answer is you just need to heat it up in hexane because there's no ionic intermediates in a Diels Alder. So that's kind of the point, is that there's no acid, there's no base, you don't need UV light, you just add the diene and the dienophile and you heat them up, right, to get the Diels Alder to occur. And then if you heat it too high, then you can get the retro Diels Alder occurring. So it's nothing more than just heating it up in a neutral solvent. Why? Because a Diels Alder has no ionic intermediates in it. It's a cycloaddition reaction. Okay. Let's move on and let's talk about some nucleophilic additions at carbonyl groups. I picked out a few of these. Does anybody remember if you take a ketone like this and you treat it with cyanide, and that could be sodium cyanide, whatever, in water, you make this functional group here. This is called, this is called a, I'm not trying to circle it anymore. This is called a cyanohydrin. So in a cyanohydrin, would this be a nucleophilic substitution? No, because we're not substituting anything for anything else. So it's not an electrophilic substitution either. It's an addition reaction, right? Because you're taking the cyanide and you're adding it here. All right, in the first step. So is it a nucleophilic addition or is it an electrophilic addition? Well, what I've drawn here is a nucleophilic attack. 
So therefore, this could be a nucleophilic addition reaction. So the answer is C. Nucleophilic addition between cyanide and a ketone can make a cyanohydrin. Let's take a look at this one here. I think this is one that I go over in organic chemistry one maybe, or maybe we've seen it before. But um, does anybody remember this compound here? If you have NH2, NH2, this is called hydrazine. So hydrazine. And if you take a ketone and you treat it with hydrazine, you get what's called a hydrazone. Hydrazone. And the hydrazone is going to be A. So this is a reaction that we looked at um, in the nucleophilic um, substitution reaction. So this is called a hydra, hydrazone. So make sure you know what a hydrazone is. And I told you the hydrazones can be used in the synthesis of aromatic compounds. Next question that I picked was this one here. I wanted to go over this one kind of quickly. This is something that we looked at in the alcohols chapter, um, alcohols and ethers chapter. Um, it says here, which is the main product that can be isolated from this reaction shown here. So you're taking cyclohexanone, and then this is ethylene glycol. So this is just this compound here. Okay, this is ethylene ethylene glycol, the same ethylene glycol found in antifreeze. Then we have toluene sulfonic acid and C6H6. Well, that's benzene. Benzene. So could anybody answer this question? If you take the ketone, treat it with ethylene glycol, catalytic amount of acid, just cook it up. What kind of functional group do you get? There's only one correct answer here. Yeah, it's C. You end up with, it's, Caitlin, could you identify the functional group in C? I don't remember what it's called. Uh, okay. What about an acetal? Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there we go. So make sure you know the difference between an acetal and a hemiacetal. I'll review it with you quickly. If you have a carbon that has kind of like two ethers on it, like this, okay, we call that an acetal. And then let's say you have a carbon that's got an ether on one side, and then you've got a hydroxyl on the other. That's the hemiacetal. So hemi. Acetal and hemiacetals came up a little bit in the in the ethers and alcohols chapter, but they also came up in the carbohydrates chapter when we looked at the anomeric carbon. You know, in alpha D glucopyranoside is a hemiacetal, and then we said you can make a glycoside, which is an acetal. So things like that. All right, you know, question number eight is a question that I don't know. I don't think I ever showed you a question exactly like this one. Like many of these questions I can say, oh, I showed you something that was basically the same thing. I don't know if we ever looked at a question that was exactly put this way in class, but it's a neat question. It says, um, which compound would be most rapidly hydrolyzed by aqueous HCl to give methanol as a product? So we said, okay, if you take an ether like this and you just treat it with HCl in water, you know, you're going to protonate this, right, uh, like this, and then a nucleus, you know, chloride can come in, okay, and so you'll end up, you know, making methanol in that reaction. So there's no doubt that you can get methanol here. The same thing would apply here. If you did the same thing, right, you'd make methanol from this and from this, and here you could make methanol from this and this. But the thing that makes D unique OK, is because all of the other ones, you're doing an SN2 on. Um, let me use a bond line structure here. Maybe I'll just draw the intermediate that I was trying to draw. So let's say you have your CH3 oxygen, one, two carbon, one, two, three. Right. You'd end up with this as your intermediate. OK, and then chloride could come in and do a nucleophilic attack like that. And then you end up making methanol. The reason that D is different than all the other ones is because you end up with a stabilized carbocation um, if that leaves. So since you have like this is um this is an acetal, right? And uh, 
acetal, as I told you, because this carbon has an ether on it and this carbon has an ether on it. So since that's an acetal, it gets hydrolyzed way faster. And so what you end up with is you end up with one, two, three. Um, you know, you, this is your acetal here, but you end up protonating one of these like this, right? And then that ends up leaving to give you this carbocation. So let me just pencil that carbocation in like this. But the carbocation is resonance stabilized, right? So you can stabilize this carbocation, comme ça, as we say in French, so that you end up with something like this where everything has a complete octet. And so that's why the acetal could get hydrolyzed. Now, I've gone over your exam a couple of times. I don't have this exact question on there. Um, it's, it's not on your exam, but I thought it was a pretty neat question and just something that I want you to be aware of. You know, an acetal is going to hydrolyze so fast because you end up with an intermediate that's resonance stabilized. That's all. Nothing more than that. Uh, the next one I wanted to look at was, hey, just a, a green yard chemistry. So a little bit of green yard chemistry here. Um, and we covered that in the alcohols chapter. So the green yard chemistry. And what it's asking you about here is if you take this compound that has an alcohol on it, okay, so we've got an alcohol and then we've got an aldehyde on here, and we're treating it with one equivalent of methyl magnesium bromide, right? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen? Give me one second here. So if you're treating this with methyl magnesium bromide, um, it's kind of a weird question in a way. I'm not a big fan of this question because you've got two functional groups in the compound. And we always said that if you take methyl magnesium bromide and if you have an alcohol in the molecule that is just going to deprotonate that, but you can see that that's, you know, um, yeah, okay, so they do have the right answer here. So what's going to happen is that when you take methyl magnesium bromide, after the first step, you're just going to end up with this. Okay, so you end up with this alkoxide, this CH2, and then there's your aldehyde. Because this is a very strong base, okay, it's going to rip that proton off way before it would do a nucleophilic attack on the aldehyde. And then after you treat that with aqueous acid, in step number two, you just end up going right back to where you started. Okay, so CH, um, CH2 with your aldehyde. But then what happened when the, when the methyl magnesium bromide, when the methyl um, anion, so this anion, CH3 minus, when it ripped the proton off of here, you end up producing methane gas. So it's nothing really interesting but you end up with D, just the production of some methane gas and regenerating your starting material. So not a very effective kind of reaction. In fact, I would call that an ineffective reaction. All right, so there we go. That's that one, a little bit of green yard. Uh, the next one, question 17, uh, says which reagent will accomplish the conversion shown below? So we've got two electrophilic centers in here, don't we? Or two electrophilic carbons. This carbon is delta plus, but we know that since you have a resonance structure that you could draw like this, and I'll just try to squeeze it over here, that you also have this as an electrophilic carbon. So you've got an electrophilic carbon here and here, or here and here, you can put it either way. And you want to attack at the, at the beta unsaturated carbon. So this is an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. So if you want to attack at the, um, maybe I should use a different color here. If you wanted to attack at this green carbon, does anybody remember what you would use as your nucleophile in this case? It's not going to be a green yard because that would attack the yellow carbon. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember what the name of that reagent is, Caitlin? I'm going, I'm trying again here. Really quizzing you. No, I don't remember. Okay, it's the Gilman reagent. So this is called a Gilman 
Gilman, free agent. So the coop rate, right, is what I call it probably most of the time, just a coop rate. And so a coop rate is going to attack where the green carbon is. There's something called a hard and a soft nucleophile. One day I was lecturing and I let that slip out of my mouth. It's nothing that we learn in this class. It's beyond the scope of our course, but um, that's kind of the way we describe those different types of nucleophiles. But the way our book presents it is you just need to know that the Gilman would attack at the green carbon and keep it like that. The green yard, right, this green yard, that would attack at the yellow carbon, but the Gilman attacks at the green carbon. All right, something I just wanted to go over with you. So Gilman reagent. So make sure you check out cuprates. Um, you would find cuprates in the um, carboxylic acids chapter. We did a whole little section on cuprates. And I think I put another question in here about cuprates. Uh, where was it? No, not there. I must have picked one somewhere else. Like, let me just review something with you then. I'll take some blank, some Taylor Swift blank space here. Like a, a thing that we saw with cuprates you remember we talked a bunch about how to take a carboxylic acid and how to convert it into an acid chloride. So you do this, so uh, thionyl chloride, and you end up with the acid chloride. And this is where we started in the acid, you know, chapter, the carboxylic acid chapter, because these are so reactive. And we said, okay, well, there's a lot of reactions you can do with these. Um, if you take an acid chloride and you treat it with um, so let's say excess R, M, G, B, R, followed by um, treatment with aqueous acid. In that case, you end up with an alcohol. So you'd end up, let's call this R prime. So you'd end up with R prime being added twice, right? However, if you use a Gilman reagent, so we just put R to uh, cuprate with a lithium cation. In that case, you end up making a ketone. So let's call this R double prime. So you'd end up with R carbonyl R double prime. Okay, so that's something you need to know. You need to know the difference between the reactivity of an acid chloride with a green yard versus a cuprate or a Gilman reagent. Either way, you can call it either one, cuprate or Gilman reagent. Either one is perfectly acceptable. All righty, well, let's go back into our great and wonderful review. Question 19 is kind of an interesting question. This is like typical of any kind of ACS or MCAT exam where they love to ask you two things at the same time. Okay, they're really hooked on that kind of stuff. So it says what ketone and aldehyde are going to produce um, the same alcohol three when submitted to the reaction condition shown below. So the first one, I think the best way to do this is just to draw what the answers would be. So it says one gets reduced using lithium aluminum hydride to give you compound three. Well, one must be a ketone, right? So one must be this, where you have a carbonyl here, and lithium aluminum hydride doesn't affect the double bond at all. So that must be one. So that's this, that's this. Uh, it's not this, and it's not this. So that means the answer must be B or D. And then for number two, it says you've got something plus this giant, giant green yard reagent here. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in it. And then followed up by water gives you the product. So if you count backwards here, one, two, three, four, five, six, well, that something must be an aldehyde, right? So number two must be this aldehyde. So that means it would be this one. And it's not definitely not that. So the answer would be B. This is really kind of just a synthesis. Do you know it or do you not? I would put that in that category. Give me a thumbs up. Does everybody follow me on this one? Like one is just a reduction, which is from the alcohols chapter, you know, where we first covered reduction with LAH. And the second one would just be a green yard. So it's kind of like just two questions at a time of, you know, same, same, synthesizing the same molecule, really. Nothing more than that. Okay, let's move on. Let's try one more Vitig for gold time's sake. Vitig, I don't know, Vitig, great, such a great chemistry. But the Vitig reaction, you can be sure the Vitig reaction will come up on your final exam. It would come up on any kind of standardized exam in organic chemistry. It's such a classic. 
um you know we even do the the um we even do the vitig reaction in the lab in the wet lab in the fall so let's see here so we're taking um this compound so we're taking triphenyl this phosphonium salt so we've got ph3 p plus and then we've got ch three so i'm just going to put ch2 and i'm going to put a proton here because in the first step we're going to treat that with butyl lithium right this is butyl lithium so you have one two three four you have the carbanion you have the lithium cation this oops this is going to behave as a base it's going to rip this proton off here so that you end up with the illid so let's draw the illid or you could draw the illine doesn't matter and now we end up with this, and this is our Vitig reagent, so to speak. So you'd also end up with butane, which is a gas, so that goes up the smokestack, and you'd also end up with lithium iodide, which is a salt, which is soluble in water. And then the Vitig reagent is going to react with the ketone. So it reacts with this part of the molecule right here, and we could draw the ketone um like um we can put it like this so here's the carbonyl we've got our methyl group like this then you have ch for the double bond and then you have another zh so this is the way it's going to react you draw the curved arrows if you want to it's not necessary but what's going to happen is you're going to end up forming the oxophosphatane and you're going to replace this oxygen with a ch2 group so you end up after the mechanism is done, you end up with this compound. So you have a double bond to a CH2, double bond here, and this. So that's your final product. That better be one of the answers. It is. It's A. All right. It's nothing with a carbonyl. It's not an alcohol, and it's not an alcohol. So if you really knew your Vitig chemistry well, you could have solved that by process of elimination very rapidly. You just said, well, it's not B, C, or D. But the way that I've done it, too, where you kind of go stepwise through the mechanism, that works, too. Either way. All right. Any questions about Vitig before we move on? Good old the good old Vitig reaction. So will that reaction work with any ketone, or with, were there any kind of restrictions on on that ketone? Um, I wouldn't. So there are some restrictions, Caitlin. The Vitig has nuances and ways that you can change the stereochemistry for days. OK, but I would never ask you a question about a Vitig and present to you a ketone that it wouldn't work with. OK, yeah, because we I, there are limitations, but it's something that's not covered in our class. There was never anything like, oh, where it has a bulky group. It doesn't work. That was never part of our class. So I can't I would, I would not ask you that. But I see your rationale. Yeah, because if there's one thing that organic chemistry loves to do, it's to float, you know, every exception. You know. <laughs> Yeah, am I right? You know, yeah. It's just like look at that acid catalyzed ring opening that we looked at. I mean, there was a whole diatribe about that on the book or in the book. But you know, how many how many questions can I ask about one concept? You know, or you know, something like maybe one. You know, so yeah, I see where you're coming from. But no, there's no limitations really in terms okay. of the ketone. Yeah, nothing that we would cover. All right, that's a great question. A uh, totally fair question. Uh, what's this one here? I went over these early this morning and just picked up ones that I thought were good. It says, this reaction that is typical of carboxylic acids, esters, acid halides, and anhydrides is called, so how would you describe this? You've got an acid chloride in water, really fast reaction, nucleophilic, non-acyl. Anybody have an answer for this? This is something that I've probably said a bunch of times, and that doesn't mean like, oh, you have to remember everything Mr. Dion ever said. But it's the I think it's the title of a chapter or a big section of a chapter. It's definitely nucleophilic, right? Because water is behaving as a nucleophile on an acyl group, right? And it's doing a substitution. So this would be nucleophilic acyl substitution. All right. Again, I'm not sure if I have any questions on the exam where it's like, give me the definition of this reaction, you know. But it's worth just looking at and thinking about it. Uh, here's an important reaction. Something, anything where you use benzoic acid has got to be important. Who could answer this one quickly? It says, what's the best way to take benzoic acid and convert it into benzoyl chloride? 
I know you all know the answer to this one. Yeah, absolutely. It's thionyl chloride. Yep. So the answer is B. Yeah, and B is called thionyl chloride. Great. Okay, so that's something that we looked at, you know, a whole bunch of times, but just want to review it with you. Uh, the next one, this, some of the answers here are a little bit wacky. And so it's not meant to be a, anything to trick you or anything. It just says, which intermediate is involved in the mechanism of this base promoted hydrolysis? This is an ester, obviously, and I guess nothing's obvious, but this is an ester. This is base. So this is a saponification reaction. Saponification reaction. Now, if you're in base, uh, a couple students have asked me this. They said, okay, so if I'm in a base, base is negative, right? So you're never going to end up with a positively charged intermediate in base. That is absolutely true. Okay, so we can scratch this one where it's a carbocation right away. That is not happening. But my second question to you, and you don't have to answer it, is you can try. Has anybody ever seen any kind of intermediate like this in their life in organic chemistry? I've never seen anything where you had two separate charges and square brackets. I don't even know what the heck this is. I've been an organic chemist for a long time. I'm not sure what either of these are. So. And I'm not trying to be facetious here. I don't know what those are. So A and B are just way off in left field. The answer is C. But my whole point here is that I would expect you to review, review the mechanism. Review the mechanism of saponification. It's such an important mechanism, right? So you have your ester, and then you have your base, right? Your hydroxide. And you can see that what they've drawn here in C is nothing more than the intermediate after the first nucleophilic attack, right? You end up with this tetrahedral intermediate where you have your hydroxyl here and then uh, and like this, okay? So then what's gonna happen is you're going to lose your ethoxide and you end up with this. So you end up with benzoic acid plus ethoxide. And you might think the reaction is over, but you're in base. So you're going to rip this proton off and then in the next step you'd have to protonate it. But the bottom line is this is an intermediate in the synthesis of, um, of, uh, of or sorry, in the, in the saponification reaction. So make sure that you review the mechanism of saponification. And I would also review the mechanism of Fischer esterification. Let me scribble that down here just so you can make a note of it. So review Fisher esterification. Fisher. It's such a big reaction in organic chemistry. And then also review the, the acid hydrolysis of an ester. So acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis of an ester. Okay, all of those I consider to be very, very important things that just are very crucial in organic chemistry. Let's face it, some things show up more than others. Those are things that are just, they just never go away. You can see that I didn't give myself a lot of room here to answer question number eight. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. Let me just try to zoom in here so that's what we can focus on. It says, what product would you isolate from these reactants? So if you take acetyl chloride or acetyl chloride, so acetyl chloride, it's just the acid chloride analog of acetic acid, and you treat it with ethylamine, ethylamine. Um, there we go, what do we end up with? Could anybody answer this one? In, in our textbook, it always said excess of this or two equivalents or something, but you can just leave it like that. Yeah, the answer is that you get an amide, isn't it? Right, so you end up producing an amide. Yep, so you end up with an amide. Good. You know, this again falls under the umbrella of um, chapter 20. So chapter 20. I always consider, to me, chapter 20 is like the biggest chapter in the whole book. However, I don't say that during the semester. I'm telling you that on the last day because that is my feeling. 
and I've said that before, and students don't like that. And they say, well, then I got put my guard down for chapter 21, and I found that one harder. So it varies from person to person. But to me, there's just such a huge amount of reactions in chapter 20. So you want to review those ones. With that in mind, there is a reaction that I want to look at right here. Let's say you want to take a carboxylic acid and you want to convert it into a ketone. So I think this is something that we looked at a few minutes ago, if I'm not mistaken. And does anybody remember this one? So if you want to take a carboxylic acid and make a ketone directly from it, something that we looked at just a few minutes ago. Yep, absolutely. So we can cross this one out, right, Karen? The first thing we need to do is take um, the propionic acid, and we need to treat it with SOCl2. SOCl2, and that's going to make the acid chloride. Yep, absolutely. And then if we want to convert it into the methyl ketone, you know, there's some kind of reagent that we need here. So if we go back, in the notes, there was somewhere that I would put it, just bear with me, I'll find it here. Just give me, here we go. Okay, so this is something that we reviewed a few minutes ago. After you make that acid chloride, you can take the acid chloride, treat it with a green yard and you get an alcohol, but if you treat it with a Gilman reagent or a cuprate, that will give you, that will give you a ketone. And that's what we want. So let's go back to our question. So we need to use the Gilman, which better be one of the answers. Or was I? Somewhere around here. So the answer is we need to use B. We're going to use a Gilman reagent to make the methyl ketone. So we'll put here um, the, the methyl cuprate. And that's it. There you go. So Gilman chemistry. So you can see that it's important to ACS, so it must be considered you know, important chemistry. Uh, let's see here. I had another one. Uh, this is more of the same, a little more carboxylic acid chemistry. Um, I'm just going to throw this number 15 out to my students. I bet you can answer this one. You know, how would you take this carboxylic acid and make the NN dimethyl um, amide here? Yeah, I agree, Caitlin. I think the answer is A. A for absolutely. Yeah, so the first step is you want to treat that, you know, with thionyl chloride. That gives you the acid chloride. And then after the second step, that produces the final product, just like that. There we go. So amide synthesis, yeah, from a carboxylic acid. The next one, this is an important reaction. It's one of those things that I showed you. There's no mechanism. So we, you could even write here, no, no mechanism in book to the point where I don't even know if it's all that well understood. You take an amide and treat it with lithium aluminum hydride. This is one of those ones where I'd have to say you've got to either, you have to know it or you don't kind of thing. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I'm just saying it's the reality. Could anybody answer this one? Take an amide and you treat it with lithium aluminum hydride. Does it, doesn't that remove the ketone? Absolutely. It just like burns it away, right, Karen? It's just whoop, it's gone like that. Absolutely. So what she's saying is if you have an amide like this, so let's just make a primary amide, or sorry, a secondary amide like they have here. After you treat this with LAH, in the first step, and then you treat it with water in the second step, it's like the ketone just magically goes away like this. Okay, so the answer would be D. 
that's the only one where the ketone is, is just vaporized kind of thing. And again, there's no mechanism for that one in the book. It's just one of those things that's it's a useful reaction. There's no doubt about it, but maybe not well understood. And maybe it is better understood than I know. But, um, you know, not definitely not an elementary reaction. That's for sure. All right, there we go. So I would put a star by that one. Make sure you know that one. Uh, what else here? Oh boy, I got more lithium stuff in here. This was just, I wanted to make sure that you understood that this is a nucleophile, right? When you have lithium, well, lithium is a cation and that goes back to Gen Chem 1. I mean, it's a group one metal. So what you have here is this, you have um, this anion, right? The lithium ion, and then you're treating it with CO2. And if we draw the Lewis structure of CO2, well, we said, you know, if you have a strong nucleophile and you treat it with CO2, then you end up with this, where you have an extra carbon here, and then you have a carboxylate, then you protonate it with acid, and then you end up making a, a carboxylic acid. And so um, you can see, I don't even know what this is here. This is not a carboxylic acid. This is an, this is an aldehyde. This is an ester. Uh, the only possible answer is A, right? Because A, What's in there is this compound. So you have two CH3s, CH, CH2, carbonyl, and the hydroxyl. So there you go. All right. And this is um, akin to the synthesis of a carboxylic acid using a green yard. This is just using a lithium nucleophile instead of a green yard. It's the same thing, still works really well. Okay, so just kind of, you know, using your organic chemistry prowess to solve a problem. Uh, let's take a look at this one here. We have benzyl chloride. So this compound is called benzyl, benzyl, benzyl chloride. And if you take benzyl chloride and treat it with potassium cyanide, well, we've seen several times today, the cyanide is a great nucleophile. So it's going to do an SN2. Sorry for the short bond here, but you end up with this compound. So you've added a carbon. Right, you've got CH2, but now you've got CN. And remember what happens when you hydrolyze a nitrile is that it could, gets converted to a carboxylic acid. So now you have the aromatic ring, the aromatic ring, then you have CH2, and then you have a carboxyl like that. So the answer would be A, that one. All right. There we go. So that covers that whole section. Let's take a look at another one here. Um, number five, uh, again, I'm not sure if this question is on the exam or not. I can't say it is. I can't say it isn't. I don't think it is. It might be, but this is something that we looked at. There was a whole section in our book where I spent, I don't know, five minutes rambling on about enols and how if you have a ketone if you have a ketone and it's enol form, I said it's mostly going to be in the the the, the um I said it's mostly going to be in the ketone form and very little in the enol form. And then I said there's exceptions to that. Okay, so it says which of these compounds forms the most enol? And one of the exceptions, which I don't even think I brought up in class, and maybe somebody figured this out, but one exception would be phenol. Right. If you think about phenol, I mean, phenol could exist as as this, um, like this. It could, but phenol exists as an enol. Why? Because it's aromatic, and this is not aromatic. So that would be an exception. But there is another exception. I'm just going to ask you quickly. I won't. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Is there anybody here that could identify? One of these compounds is kind of like not like the other if you make an enol. I would say this is kind of another sort of you know it. Or, yeah, it's A, okay? So why did Caitlin say it's A? Well, if you make the most substituted double bond of enol from A, the reason why the enol form is going to exist, uh, shoot, I don't have a lot of space here. I'll draw it like this. OK, the reason why it works in this case is because if you have the enol, since you have one, two, three, right? You notice that this one is one, two, three, four. This one doesn't have another carbonyl, and this one only has one carbonyl. 
when you have that special one three arrangement when you make the enol what's so special about this enol is that the hydrogen can participate in hydrogen bonding so you've got hydrogen bonding here that stabilizes the enol so that would be another exception okay as to why this can exist as an enol so that's kind of like well that's the answer i mean i don't know what else there is to say about it Give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the rationale. If you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Hydrogen bonding is the, strong it's the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Yeah. Okay. Like, um, uh, you know, we would have seen it when we looked at 1,3-dicarbonyl compounds. You know, that's, that's really where we would have talked about that. But anyhow, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, this one here is an interesting question. It's not a simple question. But if I show you how to solve it, it becomes very, very quick. Um, it says here, which of these reactants can be used to make the compound shown by an intramolecular aldol reaction? So if you want to do an intramolecular aldol, the way that you do the retrosynthesis for these is always the same. You take this bond and you break it. Okay, so if we take that bond and we break it, look, you draw this. So look, you draw the six-membered ring. I'm drawing it pretty big here. There's the bond, there's the methyl, there's the carbonyl. So what you do is you break that bond. So I'm gonna get my pixel eraser out here. And then on this carbon, you put a hydroxyl, or sorry, an oxygen. So that's the other ketone. And then you just delete, you know, that, okay? So you end up, so that would be the starting material. Okay, nothing more than that. So you end up making the enolate here, and then that does a nucleophilic attack, and then you lose, you know, so on and so forth, you end up losing water to produce the double bond. But the bottom line is, is that your starting material, if you count the carbons, you have one, two, three, four, um, five, six, seven carbons, and then you have a carbonyl on carbons two and six. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You've got a carbonyl here, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. So that would be your starting material. Is that one of the compounds in here? Yes, it's B. So that's how you would do the intramolecular aldol reaction. And that's how you do the retrosynthesis synthesis of it. I've taught it for years and I teach it the same way every time. You just break that bond and draw the carbonyl and that's it. That's how you do the intramolecular aldol retrosynthesis. Uh, this is kind of a straightforward question and I don't like to use the word straightforward in organic chemistry. But I would like to think that people could solve this by process of elimination, if anything. It says, which one of these compounds can't you, you cannot do an aldol reaction with it? Could anybody identify like one of these is special and that you can't do aldol chemistry? So meaning if you were to take the, the reactant, whether it's A, B, C, or D, and treat it with some, you know, sodium hydroxide, just some dilute base, you'll get no reaction. Nothing can happen. Which one of these is unique in that regard? So remember, in order to do an aldol reaction, you've got to be able to deprotonate, right? With A, we would have this, okay? So we'd have, we'd be able to deprotonate here, right? We can deprotonate the alpha carbon. Same thing in C, you could um, uh, deprotonate here, okay? So you could deprotonate there. In D, same thing, you can deprotonate Son of a gun. In D, you can deprotonate here, like this. And in this one, as I said, you could deprotonate here. And in C, you can deprotonate here. It's only B that has no enolizable proton. So no enolizable proton. Since there's no proton on any alpha carbon here, you can't make any kind of enol from that. So it won't react. You've got to be able to have some of the, the enolate form. 
in order to do an aldol reaction. Um, this one here, it says, what is the starting material that will yield this compound upon treatment with sodium um, ethoxide and, and um, ethanol? So this is, you know, this comes from, this is a beta keto ester, right? This is alpha, this is beta. So this is a beta keto ester. So this comes from a Claisen reaction or a Claisen condensation. But since it's intramolecular, this is the Diekmann reaction or the Diekmann condensation. So the Diekmann, ah, Diekmann reaction. So, you know, the easiest way to do this is to do the retrosynthesis and just break this bond here and then say, well, I need to have an ethyl ester coming off of this carbon where that, where that blue line is, right? Because I'm in sodium ethoxide in ethanol and I have an ethyl, you know, it's an ethyl ester. So I can only make it from an ethyl ester. So if you count the carbons, I'll use my green pen. You count from the carbonyl, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that means you've got to have, bear with me here, you've got to have a carbonyl, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. And then you have an ethyl ester out here and you have an ethyl ester out here, All right? So that would be our starting material. So you've got a total of one, two, three, four methylenes. You can see here we only have three, so that's not possible. Here, this is just plain wrong. We only have three here. In C, you've got one, two, three, four, five. So that, so A, B, and C can't be correct. It's only D that has four, right? So what you end up doing is you end up forming the enolate, right? And then that does an intramolecular clasin, which again is the Diekmann reaction, and it cyclizes. So make sure you review the clasin condensation. So clasin, clasin, any other clasin uh, reaction or clasin condensation, and the Diekmann, which is just kind of mentioned as an aside, but as long as you understand the clasin, you understand the Diekmann. It's just a cyclic version of it. Uh, and I think that was all I had from that section. Uh, let's try a little bit of aromatic chemistry, a little bit of electrophilic aromatic substitution in that vein. This is question one. It says, let's say you have a group attached to an aromatic ring. Um, which substituents would deactivate benzene? Could anybody identify which one of these is act or de a deactivating group? So we're looking for deactivating groups. So we looked at activators, strong activators, weak activators. Yeah, it's one and two, isn't it, right? One is a deactivator and two is a deactivator. Three is an activator, so that doesn't fall under the same. So this is an activator. In fact, it's a strong activator. Um, so yeah, the answer is one and two only. So where's the one and two only? Yep, that's this one here. Yes. All right, yeah. I knew it was two because I had seen specifically that exact one as an example. But I don't really uh -huh. understand why that would be a deactivator. Yeah, it's, that's a good question. So it's because the, when the nitrogen has a positive charge on it, so you can imagine that when a nitrogen is, you know, having a positive charge like this, that it's super electropositive. Right, it's pulling electrons away like crazy, Caitlin. The thing is, you can't draw like you know. Sometimes students will try. Well, I'll just draw a resonance structure where I show this, so I stabilize the negative, the positive charge, and then I'll have a positive charge in the ring. Well, you can't draw that because that would exceed the octet rule of a nitrogen, so you can't do that. But think about it: if you just have a plain old nitrogen that's uncharged, okay, like this. Let's say you have two R groups. Well, it's electron donating via resonance, right? But it's also electron withdrawing by induction. However, once you protonate it, now it's super positive. So it's pulling electron density away from the ring like crazy, and it can't donate any electron density whatsoever. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so that's the rationale. I mean, you're right. It's one of those things that's shown in the table. 
in our textbook. I totally get that. And I don't even know if there's a question in our book about it. If there is, there, it might be one, you know? So it's something that doesn't come up a whole lot compared to this, right? I probably asked you a bunch of questions about carboxylic acids, but yeah, that's the rationale. Uh, continuing on in the same vein, this is more electrophilic aromatic substitution. It says, which structure represents a major intermediate in the nitration of toluene? So let's say you take toluene, toluene, which is methylbenzene, and we do a nitration. So that takes nitric acid and some sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And of course, you end up making a nitronium ion. It's not asking us, but to do that. But anyhow, so are there any of these that you could eliminate kind of right away? Just say, that's not, that's not right. Like the methyl group, yeah. Okay, so we can scratch off A and B, right? We can scratch out A and B. Why? Because a methyl group is an ortho para director, right? And this is a nitro in the meta position, and this one's in the meta position. So those are just plain wrong, right? A and B. Also, we know that after the nucleophilic attack occurs, so let's say it attacks at the para position, like this, okay? Then we end up with our sigma complex, but what's the charge in the ring when we make a sigma complex? Like this, if we have our nitro like this, just give me a second here to draw all this. Right, the sigma complex has a positive charge in it. Never have a negative charge in a sigma complex. No, that's a huge no-no. Maybe I shouldn't cross out the negative charge, but we'll put an arrow towards it. No, that's not a thing. This is the only one that represents a sigma complex after para um, substitution. So this is the sigma complex. All right, go. Uh, let's take a look at this one here. This is a friedel crafts alkylation. What would be the major product of this reaction? So this is butyl chloride. So one, two, three, four, butyl chloride, this compound, okay? And aluminum chloride. And we're just doing a Friedel Crafts. So this is Friedel Crafts alkylation. Okay, what do we end up making? Could anybody identify? Well, did I highlight the answer? Good gravy. I done that. This is the second time I did that today. Anyhow, I think that everybody gets my drift here. Is that when you form, you know, the the complex, right? Because Aluminum chloride is a Lewis acid, so it's an electron acceptor. So when you form the complex between the Lewis acid in your alkyl halide, um, sorry, got my positive charge in the wrong spot. So it looks something like this, but then when it when it breaks apart, you're going to have a simultaneous hydride shift right over here, and then um, you're going to lose this. So you end up with you end up with something that looks like this, where you have a secondary carbocation. You're not going to end up with a primary carbocation because that's so unstable. So that means that the electrophilic aromatic substitution is going to occur right at that carbon. So the answer would be B. You end up with a sec butyl group, not a butyl group, on your on your ring. Give me a thumbs up if you remember that. If you're like, you know, I do partially remember it. I might have to go back and look at it one more time. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's one of those things. It, we definitely discussed it and said, you know, if you, let's say you wanted to make, let me just throw this question out there to you. Um, I don't have a lot of blank space here. Like, let's say we go, I don't know, here. And let's say you wanted to do the synthesis of benzene and then you wanted to make butyl benzene. Um, one, two, three, four. Could anybody suggest like how you would do that? You just you just want that product only. There is a strategy we can take. Could you use acylation instead? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you have to use acylation in the first step. So you have to use um, butanoyl chloride. Oops, that's not very pretty. Butanoyl chloride and aluminum chloride, right? And that would give you the carbonyl, and then you burn that off using a Clemenson reduction. So the zinc mercury amalgam and HCl, right? And you heat that up. And there you go. Okay, so that's how you would solve that one. Anyhow, let's 
to go back to it. Where was I? Somewhere down here. Oh, good grief. Did it delete all my work? Oh, probably. Yeah. Didn't say freaking thing. Uh, we did that one. We did this one. We did that one. We did a lot of work today already. Did. Um, then we were done. Oh, I saved some of this. Okay. So we got that one. Oh, let's try number four. This one's just a quick. Again, I highlighted the answer. Mr. Dion must not have been paying attention when he was going through the question. So this one is just a bromination, which I think everybody would be able to identify as bromine with iron tribromide. So just, um, you know, aromatic bromination. Um, and this is the one that we just covered, right? If you wanted to make propyl benzene, so you want a propyl group. First, you have to do um, acylation followed by Clemenson reduction. So the answer would be A to that one. Uh, what else did I have on the hip array in here? Uh, question number eight. More stuff about, hey, this is a good question. I like this question. Very good question. Number eight. It says, for the nitration of bromobenzene with nitric acid and sulfuric acid, right? We saw this, I don't know, two minutes ago. We were talking about the nitronium ion. Okay. And you get... You know, bromine is an ortho pair director, but why is bromine an ortho pair director? Which one of these explains, provides the rationale? Remember, we looked at all the different resonance structures or different, yeah, different resonance forms of the sigma complex. There's one that explains why a halogen is an ortho pair director. Can anybody tell me which one of these it is? Can almost play a game of one of these is not like the other in a way, I guess. Okay, so maybe you want to go back and review electrophilic aromatic substitution, so um, EAS chemistry. And the reason why a halogen is an ortho pair director is because of this resonance structure here. Or even though um, it's electron withdrawing by induction, so you might think, okay, it's going to be a meta director, but it's not. It's an ortho pair director. Because when you draw the sigma complex, you get this one extra resonance structure when you draw the substitution 